welcome to our Hot Rod Bible Study. So tonight we're in James chapter 3. Um, it is a, a mighty chapter. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and read um, the whole... Uh, we're just going to be doing verses 1 um, through 12 tonight. And so we're just going to do partial uh, the partial of the, of the whole chapter. Um, it is a powerful, powerful um, 12 verses. Um, and so I wanted to break it apart in small sections so we could uh, hear from the Lord tonight. And so I'll go ahead and read it. Um, verses 1 through 12, and then we'll go back and see what the Lord has for us. But before that we do that, um, let's pray to the Lord for our study tonight. So, Father God, we come before you tonight, Lord. And we ask, Lord, um, that you would speak into our hearts, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that we would um, take your word out as whatever it is that we take from it tonight, Lord. Would we take it to a world who so desperately needs it, Lord? Um, help us, Lord, to be a light. You have called us, each and every one of us, Lord, you've called us to be a light. And so, Lord, we, we ask that you would uh, do those. Um, have your way with each and every one of us tonight, Father. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So here we go. In verse 1, um, chapter 3, it says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body, that we may turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, whatever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed, and he has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. And so as we've um, been studying through the book of James, um, we're here in chapter 3, and we're um, going to be, after tonight, we're going to be more than halfway through um, the book of James. And it's only five chapters in the book of James, but it has been, um, you know, considered one of the most practical books of the Bible. Um, and so as tonight, as we see um, the tongue, there is uh, the subject tonight, the subject is, is something that each and every person in this room struggles with. Um, and I know that um, if you're married, there's, there's many a times that we have oftentimes spoken something and later on regretted what we said to our spouse and, and you know, any of us. And, and especially, you know, one of those things that, you know, and this is on, on both ends. I know many of us are, are, are men uh, here tonight, but I'm in both ends. I mean, I, I, oftentimes that there's uh, women that also speak out of turn. And that oftentimes I don't want men to feel like I'm picking on you guys. Um, so, but on both ends, that they oftentimes we use the tongue to speak out of turn. Uh, but where we were in James 1, um, we, the Lord uh, here, they, kind of the teaching was to count it all joy uh, when we fall into various trials. And just one of the things I wanted to cover with that is this is the time that um, the Lord, when the trials come about in our lives, um, that this is when our, our, our faith is tested. And I think what we learned, and one of the biggest things that I learned from that chapter is oftentimes I always thought that this was where God would test my faith. Um, but see, see, God knows all things, and he knows how much faith I have. And so when I go through trials in my life and things happen in my life, what he's actually doing, he's allowing me to see the faith that I have. He is ensuring in each and every one of us the faith that we do have because he wants us to uh, you know, strengthen that faith 
because he's preparing us for another another job that he has for us or something in life that is going to come up ahead. And we, and I'm always reminded by that because it always reminded me of David. Um, you remember that he always he fought a lion and he fought a bear. And it was th those things in the wilderness in the, that he was fighting that was preparing him for the giant. And each and every one of us have a giant that is coming before us. And we have many, many of us have faith giants in our lives. Um, but those are the things we always need to be prepared for. And so the Lord's doing a work in that. And so just really quick in James 2, we saw the truth of not to favor others because of, you know, their wealth. Um, not to treat people differently because some people have more money than others. Um, that was one of the things. And then last week, I, it was powerful, I thought, last week when we covered um, that were people that were actually, that were works. And, and this was a, the big a discussion or the controversy that was in these verses. Um, we're talking about that people were, were saved by works and we're not saved by works. And if you got anything out of last week's study is that we know for sure that we are saved by grace. It is a gift of God that he gives each and every one of us. Um, but one of the things that we know that, um, that James pointed out that if we are saved, that the fruit of our being saved of salvation should be good works. And he, and he mentioned, you know, other things last week. We brought up the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so I just thought it was powerful. And so tonight, before we get into the study tonight, a couple of things about the tongue. Um, I actually went and looked it up. And they say the average male, uh, their tongue is 70 grams. Um, very, very small. 70 grams. Only weighs 70 grams. But one of the things I thought was interesting, they say the female tongue is, weighs about 60 grams. Um, and so mm. ours is just a little bit bigger. And, and I was thinking about this and I was thinking maybe we get a little bit more exercise than we actually claim to. But we are maybe our tongue is a little more exercise. That's why it's a little bigger. But one of the things that, that's really uh, powerful is that we see that the, our speech has a tremendous ability to um, either harm people. Um, and it has a tremendous uh, um, it has a tremendous power to actually lift people up to um, actually motivate people. And so. Um, one of the things that I, I saw is um, the speech can tear down others. And actually, um, in the very, um, I, I was surprised that this was in 1994 um, in, in Rwanda. Um, there was two tribes that were actually fighting. And it was a dispute over uh, something that was said. And later on, they never, they never really found out if there was actually any truth. And the people writing the story said there was no truth to the story, that these were words that were spoken. But this war that went on in Rwanda between these two tribes um, killed 800,000 people um, by something that was said by words. But these, these were words that were said. Um, and, you know, that, it's just amazing to me. That, that, and this was something that was said that they found out that later on there was no truth in it. Um, and here in Southern California in the 1940s, and, you know, some of us are very familiar with this, and I thought it was interesting, too. Um, in the 1940s, there was a, a man named Randolph Hearst, and he later on became um, the, actually the owner of the Herald Examiner. Um, and he, what was interesting about him, he started something in the 40s that they called um, yellow, um, they, they called it a yellow journalism, here, journalism yellow journalism. And what it is, what yellow journalism is, it's actually, it's a, it's a story like half-truths or fictional stories that he was putting in the paper, and he was printing these out. And this was interesting, and, and I, I didn't know this about the story, and this is why I'm bringing it before you. Um, this, this, these half-truths that were being printed in the newspaper, um, they were printing, he was printing these half-truths about that there was a Mexican-American people that were um, dressing up in zoot suits in the 40s. And he printed a story saying that these people were actually beating up military men along the streets. And so when it, as, he, as he put the, this word out in the newspaper, after that, all the military men, no matter what branch of military you were from, you were Army, Navy, whatever military branch you were on, it was open season on all these zoot suiters. And in the 40s, uh, they said that all of these men, no matter when they, wherever they went into town, that they would always have disputes with the military. And this was the, and this is what the, what the dispute was over. It was something that was written, half truths, fictional stories that were written um, in the newspaper. And I just thought it was interesting that the words have tremendous amount of power. Um, and so we, we see that tonight. And we're going to, as we get into um, chapter 3 tonight, we're going to see um, what the Lord and what James is speaking of, to us about. Um, so we pick it up here in verse 1. And it says, My brethren... Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. And this is one of those things. Teaching um, God's word is one of the things that I, I believe that James is pointing out to them. Uh, many of them were came from the Jewish background, and they were teaching in synagogues. 
And a lot of times people in the Jewish synagogues would like to come up and they, they felt that it was, a, it was a point of prestige that they could come up and speak the word of God. But he was telling them that they were going to receive a stricter judgment, that they were going to come before God in all the things that they were going to say. And the reason why uh, James is pointing out that it's so important because the word of God is so powerful that we can uh, draw people to God, but also too by an ill-spoken word, we can draw people away from God. And so this is the, one of the things, and I think one of the things that's so valuable and so important that we see in this, that oftentimes I believe that it is uh, a pastor or, uh, you know, there's other people, there's uh, deacons, other people, but I think it's their witness that actually speaks louder than their words. The way they live their lives and the way they speak to others. And, you know, it's interesting that all the times that we've come um, before Pastor Ed, many of us, and I, I've had problems in my life where I've had times, opportunities where I've needed to talk to Pastor Ed, and I've asked to speak to him. And, many, and you know, what I loved about when he used to do the Bible study, and maybe this is the reason why he doesn't do the Bible study anymore, is that I used to come to Pastor Ed and I say, Pastor Ed, I got something going on. Can you know, can you, can we kind of talk a little about it? And I tell him a little bit, and he'd give me godly advice, and, and I always loved that. But one of the things that I'm always reminded of that we have that, that has the potential to, you know, people, some people like there's certain pastors that are untouchable. that You can't talk to them. Um, you, you, there's no way you can talk to them. They're, they won't interact with common people. And this is the thing that we are so blessed to have a pastor like Pastor Ed that we can interact with him. And I know um, on Saturday I went down to the donuts and he was there and he is he is not a, he makes himself available. And this is one of the things that I believe that a, a man of God should be. He should be available. Um, but one of the things here that I see that. We uh, see that uh, a person that's, that's reading the Word of God should be held in a higher regard because he spends more time reading the Word of God. And also, um, I'm always reminded of Luke um, 12, 48 that says, Too much is given, uh, much will be required. And we always remember the story um, in Exodus 17, 6. And it was when Moses was um, with the children of Israel. And, and, and the thing I love so much about the children of Israel, when they brought him out, out of Egypt, that the, the children of Israel were a lot like us. They were always murmuring. We don't got enough. We don't got enough water. We don't got enough food. They're always complaining. They, the Lord provided manna for them. He provided clothing for them that never wore out for 40 years. But they were always complaining, right? And so this particular time, they're complaining about not having water. And this is where the Lord told Moses to actually to hit the rock. And water came out. And actually, water came out and was enough to, to, to actually have water for all the people. And there was... They, there was hundreds of thousands of people at that time, and so they wanted to make sure that they got all the people got the water, and so everything was was great. And so it wasn't too much long after that. Well, it actually took 38 years that Moses was actually teaching the people, the children of Israel, how to walk in the ways of God. And we all remember just really briefly, as I bring this up, we remember the reason why the children of Israel walked in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Because they had a desire in their heart to go back to Egypt. And remember, in the Bible, the Egypt is a picture of the world. They didn't want, they didn't trust in God's promises. They had a desire in their heart to go back to Egypt, to go back to the world. Uh, but one of the things that we see is that later on in Numbers 20, 11, after walking around with these children for 38 years, they come to another place where they run out of water. And so Moses, in his anger, he's angered by the fact that the people, he's been with them day in and day out in all these 38 years. And he's saying, is anybody listening to what's going on in the things of God? And what he does is, instead of him going, and, and he asks the Lord, and the Lord tells him to speak to the rock. He tells, the Lord tells him to speak to the rock. But in his anger and his disobedience, he goes, and remember, he smites the rock. He hits the rock. And the Lord, in his grace and his goodness, he allows water to come out of the rock. But this is when he tells Moses, because he misrepresented him, he was not going to allow him to take the children of Israel into the promised land. And, and this is one of the things that's, People that read the word of God, they, they should be under stricter judgment because they should never mislead someone. And this is one of the things that, remember, that God is love. And this is one of the things that I'm always reminded of, that Moses, it wasn't that he had done something so terrible that he had just misrepresented God. And we always need to be, and this is men of God, they always need to represent God in a, in a godly way. And this is one of the things that, that always, but we always need to be reminded of those things. Uh, really quick, the last thing I want to get, I know I'm taking a lot on this one verse, but one of the things that I feel is very powerful is that uh, teachers are, have the power, the potential for so much good. Um, there was a lady, her name was Henrietta Mears. Um, she was actually the founder of the Gospel Light Publications, and she wrote 
uh, many of books. Um, she actually was a, had a degree. I had a lady of, of a degree where I was talking to Mark a little bit about this, and I, I didn't know this, and this is the reason why I'm bringing it up tonight. Henrietta Mears was also the founder of Forest Home um, that's here locally, and so I, I just thought it was so amazing that she, a, a woman in um, that was uh, such a mighty woman for the gospel. And so we see that these gospel light publications and things that she did, um, she is listed as, as an educator. She's listed as an evangelist, an author. Um, she was born in 1890, um, and she went to be with the Lord in 1963. Um, this is the, the most important part that I thought that was interesting. It says she had three bills in her classes. Um, the first bill is uh, Bill Helverson. Um, he became the chaplain of the Senate. Um, and this is Bill Bright, um, and he was the founder of the Campus Crusade um, that goes on to, and so we are familiar with that today. But one of the most famous bills that we're probably um, familiar with is um, Billy Graham. And so we're all familiar with him. Uh, Billy Graham listed Henrietta Mears as one of the greatest Christians he ever met. And so she was a powerful lady. And so there's so many things. Uh, before the study tonight, I was asking Mark a little bit about her, and he had a way more um, to say about her than, than I actually saw online. And so I was encouraged by that. But it's just so powerful to see that somebody that is a teacher, but I know many of you, you many of you probably think, well, I don't teach. You know, I, many of you are probably sitting there saying, well, I don't teach anybody. But if you are a parent, if you are a grandparent, um, we are teachers and each and every one of us. And, you know, it, it, many times that I'm, what I'm always reminded of in my kids that, you know, oftentimes, it, as we spoke about, it's not always what we, we teach our kids because oftentimes we tell our kids, don't do this, don't do that, don't do, do, don't do that. But often it is, a, it is our example that speaks out so loudly to our children, our example, our walk, that they would see that. And remember, they always say it's not really what's taught, it's what's caught. Because our children pick up on things. And it's always interesting when, you, when you, sometimes people take their children out in the public and they either say something, uh, you know, that's, that's not right or they do something that's not right. And the parents always say, I don't know where he gets that from. <laughs> <laughs> and we always look at it and we know exactly where some of these things come from, right? They come from us. And so here in verse 2 it says, uh, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. And so um, we see this um, verse here, and I think that was uh, what I thought that was uh, I could draw from this verse right here. It says, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. Um, the word perfect here is actually a mature man, a mature. It's pointing out he is a mature man. Um, and it says that if we can control our mouth, that we can control our whole body, our whole body by controlling our mouth. Um, and so uh, I just thought it was uh, so important to, to see that we can actually control by our controlling our mouth. We control our whole body. Uh, one commentator said that um, he was a, a, what do they call that? A um, topical um, pastor. He was a topical. And so he wouldn't go book by book like we do at the packing house. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it. He was a topical. But it was interesting. He told the congregation, he told them the week before, he said, hey, next week, I really want everybody to come and I want everybody to be here because I'm going to I'm going to expose the biggest um, troublemaker in the church. <laughs> and so he said he was going to expose the biggest troublemaker in the church. And so as everybody left that day, there was people that were thinking, well, wow, I want to know who the biggest troublemaker in the church is. But there was also people that said, man, maybe I shouldn't go to church. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I shouldn't go because maybe it's me, right? And it was interesting when, when they came that day and they were all anticipating, waiting for who the biggest troublemaker in the church was going to be. He came and he opened the Bible to James chapter 3, and it is the tongue. It is the tongue. The tongue has done more things to destroy churches and the things of God and it all comes, in. and we're going to learn this tonight, and I'm sure all of you men here know this, that it really, it is not a tongue problem, it is, it is, a, it is a heart problem. Mm -hmm. It is a heart problem, right? It is, it is a heart, because you, out, of the, out of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And so it is, it is out of our heart that the mouth speaks. And so um, I just thought it was interesting that the, the pastor told him that. So here in, in verse 3, it says, Indeed, we put bits, he gives us examples, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their, their whole body. It says, look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. And so he's speaking about this horse that has this bit. And, and Ron probably knows a little bit more about this than I do. He has horses. 
And so this is where the, actually the reins and everything, as they talked about bridling, the bridle would be where the reins and everything, the bit goes into the horse. And that very small bit is what controls actually the horse to go to the right and go to the left. And actually it can actually, it becomes like in, we're, we're here in Hot Rod Bible Study, it becomes the accelerator and it also becomes the brakes, right? It becomes, whoa, stop. And so it's interesting that this very small thing, that a horse is huge, that a small, they say a small 100, 110 pound woman can control a horse very well just by that bit that is in his mouth. And so this is the reason why he's pointing out these examples. And then he makes the example of the ship. And at this time, the ships were big, but they weren't as big as they are today. And we've seen those huge um, containers that are stacked up, 10 containers on one side, and these massive ships that are driven. And they say that the rudder is anywhere from five feet to 10 feet tall, very small considering how, how huge the ship is. And so this small little instrument controls the whole ship. Uh, one of the things I had to give an example um, for the Hot Rod Bible study that would be relevant to each and every one of us is uh, the, the thing that I, I wanted to bring is it is the Pittman arm. If you're familiar with suspension and remember that this is the smallest arm in the arms of suspension that you're going because it's the one though, the smallest arm that connects to the steering box. And so that small little little uh, piece of metal is what controls the whole car from going right left and it controls it. And so um, he's trying to make this analogy. And so he's going to pick it up here in verse five and tell us what um, he's talking about and says, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest, a little fire kindles. In World War II, um, there were signs all over Long Beach um, that said um, loose lips sink ships. And, and this was one of some of the things that our lips and Proverbs, this reminded me of Proverbs 18, 21. It said, death and life are in the power of the tongue. That oftentimes that we can encourage and build people up, give them life by what we say to them, but we can also tear people down. And, and we're going to see at the end of James, this is what James is speaking about, that we should always look to build people up and not tear them down. That as we get to the end of the chapter, it's going to say, you know, fresh water and, 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 and salt water should not come from the same opening. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that we always need to be reminded of. But as we get more into the chapter, we'll see that it is a heart problem. It is not a, it is not a problem of the tongue. But really quick, uh, many people have, and, and, and the horse, it has a problem with a nature. It has an animal nature that it's fighting against, right? An animal has a nature and the, and, the, and the ship is fighting with the rudder, right? It has a problem too because it's always fighting with the winds and the waves and it's always fighting up against it, right? But us, our tongue, we're always uh, fighting with our old nature. Our old nature is always trying to call us back to the words that we used to speak before we knew Christ. That the way we used to act, the way we used to interact with people before we knew Christ. And that old nature is always trying to call us back. But one of the things that we need to be reminded of always, um, 2 Corinthians 5.17 said that, um, that any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And the old things have passed away and all things have become new. Meaning that our tongue now has become new um, and, and our words should become new. We always need to be reminded of this because us as husbands, as fathers, we need to be reminded that words, they cut. They cut people, the words that we've said. And me as a father, many times I have disciplined my children and have said things to them that I know have cut them. And, and one of the things about cutting people with words, it, it is long lasting. That a real cut, remember that it does leave a scar, but eventually it goes away. But sometimes words can last a lifetime. Cuts that we give people. And so we always need to be constantly aware of the things that we say to our children, the things that we say. And I can go to my children and I can say, son, daughter, my daughters, forgive me for what I said. And they do forgive me, but that scar is still there. That scar is still there. So we always need to be reminded of those things. And you know, I'm, as I've been studying this the last week, um, as I've been interacting with my family, I've been really, really good this past week because I've been studying uh, chapter three of James. I've been really, really good. Um, and so it's interesting as, as you start to think of these things that as this week as I was um, at home, I was thinking if, if uh, we're, what I'm about to say to my wife or to my children or even people in the workplace, I'm always thinking in my heart, is it something that comes from God or is it something, is it something that's going to lift them up or is it something that's going to tear them down? And, and by just by doing that this week, 
I have a lot less words this week than I did the previous week. A lot less words. Because oftentimes I think that as I was going through my day, I was starting to say, wow, I do say a lot of things that are not right. I say things. And, you know, I think us as men, um, you know, oftentimes women get a bad word because the women always, the men always, or people always say women are gossipers, right? But man, I, I don't know, maybe I just have a group of guys that, that and, I, and I don't mean this in the workplace that I work at now, where I used to work at before, gossip was like rampant and there was like nothing, nothing but men that worked there. And it was just one of those things that, that, that men have a, a potential to gossip about things. But the interesting part about it, we don't understand that those things hurt people. Because, you know, I, I always remember this, that somebody tells you something, Jerry, and, and they don't say, hey, don't say nothing, that, don't say nothing to Mike. But it doesn't take too long before somebody comes around and says, hey, Mike, you know what Jerry said about you? He said, what? Oh, right, positive scars, right? Give me scars. And so we always need to be reminded and really uh, to be careful of what we say. Um, it can actually destroy. Yes, it destroys people. And so here in uh, verse 6, it says, and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets the fire, the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. We see that um, as when we speak out of turn, one of the things that it does right away, it destroys our witness. When people, like I said, oftentimes we talk about this in the study all the time, that there's people that are watching you. When, you, when people know that you are a believer, a follower of Christ, they're watching you. And so when something happens and you flip out or you cuss someone out or you do something to somebody, they're like, ah, oh, that Mike, he, he says he's a Christian, but I heard him cuss out so-and-so. I heard him do this. They're watching us. And so I, I don't think that that's one of the things because one of the things as we talk about the heart, and this is, comes from a Matthew 15, 18, it says, but those, um, the, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. It says, we are to walk in love, right? And Proverbs 15, 1 says, a soft word turns away wrath. And oftentimes I think it's, uh, we, we, if we want to be differently in the world, we can't go around acting like the world. You know, the world, anytime that somebody says, and, and we see it all on social media, especially right now in, in the political, all the things that are going on politically, when somebody says something, everybody's so eager to want to fire back and say something. But a kind word, or maybe, a, a, you know, a, they used to tell us this when we were children, that if you don't have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. Don't say anything at all. It's better not to say anything at all. And one of the things I always reminded as a child, too, that remember we would always say sticks and stones might break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But this is a lie. You know, this is a lie because words do hurt and they do. They do actually. They cause deep scars. Um, one of the things here, um, as it used the word hell, I thought um, it's actually the word in, in the actual the original text. It's the word Gehenna. And James is trying to draw a picture to them to something they're familiar with. This is out of the Valley of Hinnom. It's outside of Jerusalem, and it was where they would burn trash. Um, and that constant fire um, would be a reminder of eternal fire, of an eternal fire. And so this is what um, James is trying to do to them here. But that same exact word is used in uh, Revelation 20.10. Um, it's called the Lake of Fire. And so he is just trying to say that this is where it comes from. And, and I believe that as us as followers, and you know this letter as he started off to brethren, he's speaking to believers. And, you know, he's speaking to believers. He's not speaking to non-believers. He's speaking to believers. And when it says here that it's set on fire by hell, that the enemy is always tempting us. You, we all know exactly something happens in the household. Our wife does something to us or somebody else does something to us, right? And right away that little voice starts speaking in us, right? It starts to say, are you going to let this happen? Are you going to let that happen? Are you going to let this happen? You need to tell her. You need to put her in her place. You need to do this thing. You know where that comes from? That comes from the enemy. And the only way we, we need to stay close to the word of God and, and, and when in those times that we feel that maybe we shouldn't pray, what we need to do is we need to take a time out. And I know many of you, I, I spend a lot of time in my garage. I say, you know what, Lord, this is the time I need to go in the garage for a few minutes <laughs> because I'm going to say something that I'm going to regret for a long time. And we need to put space. And oftentimes when your children, I think I've spoken about, about this here at the study before, that oftentimes when my children do something, um, I always used to be, um, I, would, I would discipline them out of anger. I would come home. Out of a hard day's work, my wife would say, oh, your son did this, your son did that. Well, and all the frustrations that I had at work and all the things that have gone on in the day, I was taking them out on my children. And so this is one of the things that I've always learned, that this is the time that we should allow time. You hear something about your children. You hear something about something that's going on in your wife. You need to take time out, think about it, pray about it. 
and then come back and say, okay, this is what we need to do. I'm not saying that, you know, that there shouldn't be discipline in the house. There should be discipline in the house, but it should never be out of anger. It should always be out of love. Just like our, our Heavenly Father, He loves us. Um, and so He's always looking to share His love with us. So here in verse 7, it says, For every kind of beast and bird uh, of reptile and every creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Um, and it doesn't take us, we don't have to go too far. A bear, if we go to the circus, we see that they're tamed. A bird, if we go to the zoo, we can see a, a parrot show. A reptile, we see snake charmers. Um, creatures of the sea, we've all gone to SeaWorld and seen Shamu, right? And see how they've been tamed. And so all these mighty uh, beasts that man has tamed them. Uh, but here in verse 8, it says, But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Uh, when I read this this past week, I was thinking, how much poison have I actually given to my own family or to actually people that are really close to me? Um, how much poison have I shared with others? And, you know, some of these things that really this the book of James, as he speaks about our words, it's very powerful um, that we would see. And this is the reason why we say it's such a practical letter, So because there's so many things that are so, people always say all the time that that book is so old fashioned. It is It is relevant to what's going on today. Um, God's word is alive, and we see that in this. Uh, but one of the things that I see that this deadly poison um, here, um, it's, it, there was actually uh, our seventh president. Um, his name is um, Andrew Jackson. Um, if you've ever read his story um, or know a little bit about it, one of the things that he was um, elected to be president in November, um, and he was waiting to be inaugurated in January. He was waiting to be inaugurated. And, 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 and you can tell in the political, if, as what's going on today, we can see in the political world, the first time you say that you're going to run for any kind of office, right, everybody tries to dig up all this dirt on you, right? They're, they try to, they try to you know, defame you by, by trying to put you down. Um, and so we can see that's what happens. And so this Andrew Jackson said, but the one that was taking most of the shots was his wife. They were, say, they were saying things about his wife, that she was a prostitute, that she was this and she was that. And they were just trying to use words to go against her. And in her diary, she wrote that the words that people said about her, she said they felt like they were arrows of poison hitting her liver because they hurt her. She was a mom. Uh, but what's interesting about those words is that she never got to see her husband be, uh, become the seventh president because in December 22nd, uh, I wrote down the year here because I knew that I wouldn't remember it. I was supposed to remember the year. Um, but she died, um, and she, it was in on, on 1828. She died um, in December 22nd before he was actually inaugurated president, before he became the president. Um, and one of the things is that many people believe is because of all the words and all the, the mud that they drug her through, it really took a toll on her. She really took it to heart. And so we need to always be reminded of these things um, that can hurt people. And so here in verse 9 says, um, for, for with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. And so in the similitude it means in the likeness of God. And one of the things that we always need to be reminded is we use it that just before we came to the study tonight, we sing praises to God, right? But, you know, I, I, I thought it, I kind of chuckled and it kind of went along with this uh, story that Pastor Ed was talking on Sunday that one of the reasons that they changed um, the actual the hours and they took away one of the services and they moved it to nine. He said because people were losing uh, their salvation in the parking lot. And I thought it was funny because <laughs> that's exactly what happens. We come into church and we praise God and we go home. And we feel good, but we get in the car and somebody cuts us off and all that goes down the tube. And we, we want to say something to somebody. Um, you know, I, I wanted to confess something to you. you know, I've been walking with Christ um, for 20 years, um, a little over 20 years. Um, but one of the things that I want to say, I no longer cuss. Cussing doesn't come out of my mouth. Um, but I want to confess to you guys, then confess to the Lord. But those words still come to the front of my forehead, and I still come. When something happens or, you know, when, and, and, and Pastor Ed always says when, uh, when you hit your, your, your finger with a, with a hammer, um, and oftentimes at work, it, it, is there, there's things that happen that are a lot less um, that happen, you know, that things happen at worst. And those words come. And I'm always amazed that, you know what, Lord, I've been walking with you 20 years. I'm trying to serve you as close as I can. When are these words ever going to go away? And this is the thing that, you know, that we talked about today. When I was thinking about this, that those words, oftentimes, they'll be with us a whole lifetime. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that we need to, and oftentimes I, I always bring this up about words, you know, cuss words and people that cuss. And, you know, and often and I always reminded that, you know, when I was very young, when uh, a person told me and, and everybody would always, you know, your parents would always tell you, you don't cuss and you don't cuss in front of your, 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 your children. And you always try not to cuss in front of your parents, especially but when we were kids, like, wow. It was it was the end. If you cussed in front of your parents, it was over. You know, I, you know, there was no such thing as you know they would they would get you. But anyway, what I'm always reminded of that somebody told me when I was very young, uh, very simple words. He just told me. He said, you know what? When people that cuss and use a lot of profanity, it just shows that they don't have other words to express themselves. And he says, so you always want to try to use words to express yourself without cussing. And, and so it, that's always been helpful to me. It was very simple because all other people ever said was don't cuss, don't cuss, don't cuss. Yeah. And that, that, that just meant like, oh, it must be something bad. But other people would say, no, no. He said, when he finally said, just use other words to express yourself, it was really helpful. And so we can see words are powerful. So here in verse 10, it says, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be so. Does a spring, then he asked three rhetorical questions. Does a spring send forth uh, fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? And the answer is no. And it says, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? Or uh, grapevines um, bear figs, and both after those are no. It says, thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh water. And as we see, as we've been studying uh, the Word of God here tonight and has been speaking to us about our tongue, we see that these things all come from the heart. We ended last week's study um, with Ezekiel 36, 26, that says that I will take out your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Right? And he says, it will give you a heart of flesh. You know, I'll put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my way. When God gets a hold of our lives, we no longer look at life the same anymore. We don't, all of a sudden, we don't look at our wives the same. We don't, we don't go to the workplace, it's not the same. We don't, we don't do anything the same anymore. We don't, we don't open the door and look out at the sky. It's not the same anymore because we have the love of Christ living in us. And this is what James is pointing out to us, that we should, it should be expressed in the way we speak to others, how we love others, and how we love the gifts that God has given us, our family and our friends and our loved ones. Uh, one of the things I want to close with tonight, um, before Mark comes up and closes us uh, tonight, um, this comes from um, uh, October. It says, October 1871. It says, Miss O'Lowry, um, his cow, um, kicked over a lantern at 8.30 p.m. And it led to the great Chicago fire. It left 100,000 people homeless, 17,500 buildings destroyed, 300 people uh, were dead, $40 million worth of damage, all because of a small lantern. One match can burn down a house, but the tongue is like a small, but it sets things aflame. And so we're always to be reminded this tongue um, can, has a potential to tell people of the love of Christ, but it also has the potential to tear down uh, people. May we always use it to elevate people to come to know the love of Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the study tonight. Father, we um, ask that you would continue to guide us, Lord, not only as a group of men, Father, but we ask as uh, followers of Christ, Lord, that may you use us, each and every one of us who have gathered here tonight, May you use us all for your glory, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the praise tonight. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Face towards 